It's a blessing for me to be home at Uganda Christian University. Um, I was here in 2004 to 2008 doing law. Then I went into the world of work. Then I came back in 2015 to do theology. And uh, now again I'm in the world of work, uh, serving God. Uh, I told those uh, who were here in the first service that uh, when I was here, I, for my first time, I was the choir master for chapel choir. And um, yeah, that is even when before the university hired the music director. So I'm glad to see them minister to us today. Praise the Lord. Um, just a bit more about the organization that I work with, African Leadership and Reconciliation Ministries. Um, it serves in eight African countries in the Great Lakes region. Uh, plus the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. And our mission is to develop servant leaders in the African church and communities who reconcile and transform lives that are affected by violence and injustice. And today, our topic is about justice. So uh, God spoke to the chaplain and team, and I want to appreciate them for trusting me with a pulpit, and I pray that I will use it well for, to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have gathered us here so that you can speak to us. So Lord, speak and help us by your Holy Spirit to listen to your word. May only your word, the message that you want us to hear today come out through me. To your praise and glory, through Christ our Lord, we have prayed. Amen. Um, the text that was read to us from the book of Prophet Habakkuk, chapter 1, uh, talks about justice. And uh, just about Habakkuk, he's someone who God uh, opened his eyes to see what was going on around him, and he found himself in a conversation with God about what was going on. That's what makes it a different book from the other prophetic books. Because in this book, Habakkuk is speaking to God and God speaking to him. They are having a conversation. Uh, the two of them, unlike other prophets who God used, gave the word and they would speak to the people directly. But this conversation they are having is still a message that, is, uh, God, that God is using to speak to the people of Judah. He ministered during the time of uh, Jeremiah. They all speak about God being unhappy with Israel and God sending uh, the Babylonians to come to destroy Judah, to punish them for they are not listening to the word of God. And uh, when we read from verse 2 of chapter 1, uh, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, let's just repeat these verses together and we see what God is, is speaking to us through the words of Habakkuk. He says, How long, Lord? Must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is polarized, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. He is crying out to God, and he says, why do you make me look at injustice? In other words, God opened Habakkuk's eyes to see what was going on around him. He gave him godly lenses to look at the surroundings. And when he saw, with the lenses of God, what we saw was injustice, violence, strife, conflict. And he said, the wicked are surrounding the righteous. And because of that, justice is perverted. And our topic for today is our Christian witness as advocates for justice. Our Christian witness as advocates for justice. This topic presupposes that when we are Christians, that Christianness in us has to, to witness it has to come up, come out with a message. And that message is advocating for justice. 
Therefore, being a Christian by default makes you an agent of justice in the world where you live, where God has placed you. But what does being a Christian mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? In simple terms, it means one who follows Christ, one who has accepted the forgiveness that God offers at the cross and has allowed Christ to rule in their lives. And that is scripture. We read in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, when the message was preached, people accepted Jesus, who died and rose again to be their savior. And those people, as we continue to read in Acts chapter 11, we find that they were named Christians, people who follow Christ. So you're giving your heart to Christ and allowing him to be your Lord and Savior. Allowing him to rule over your life is what makes you a Christian. You may have gone through the rituals of baptism and confirmation, but if you have not surrendered your life to Christ to rule it, you are not yet a Christian. You are still lost. It is about conversion of heart. It all begins at the cross where God draws us to himself and begins to rule in our lives. I personally came to that point in 1997 when God opened my eyes and he showed me my sin and I surrendered to him. I was born at church. I'm a son of a pastor. Are there pastor's children here? Eh, I see many, including the wife of your chaplain. And I grew up at church. I heard many times that I went to the altar to confess that I have accepted Christ. But in 1997, at the age of 15, as a young adolescent, God opened my eyes. He showed me my hypocrisy. He showed me how I was pretending to be good, yet I was full of sin. I understood myself, full of lust, full of deceit, and he said, you can't continue like that. He used the words of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 11, that you'll never succeed in life when you hide your sins, but confess them and give them up and the Lord will show you his favor. And I accepted him because I was hiding my sins. That's when I became a Christian. Praise the Lord. And this Christian that God has called to be an advocate for justice, needs to understand what justice is. What is justice? And in order to understand justice is, we must define it according to God's point of view, not according to man's point of view. The world's definition of justice is according to man's law. But man's law is faulty. Itself can be criminal. You look at the laws of apartheid in South Africa. And the racist laws in the United States. If a black person walked into a hotel which is marked words for whites only, that would be a crime. Now, there is a law that, it is, that is devaluing the status of another human being. So if we define justice according to man's law, we get it wrong. It has to go back to the author of justice, the one who is just himself. And we can begin from the Old Testament when God calls the prophets and he uses them to speak about justice. We begin with Moses, whom God gave the law to give it to the Israelites so they can know how God wants them to live with him in a relationship with him and with one another. And the law included the moral law, the ceremonial law about ceremonies, the civil law, and within the civil law, that's the law between man and man, he gave them both the civil and the criminal procedure codes to help them know how to handle evidence. The law that we have begins from the Bible. God is the one that authored it from the start. It's only that when we go into our human things, we add on it and we corrupt it. But we should go back to God who gives the law. And when the people forgot about the law, God sent prophets to remind them. He gave them his mind. The spirit of God rested on the prophets so that they can speak the word of God to his people and remind them how God wants them to live. This shows how God is serious about matters of justice. And we who are called by him, we should not take them lesser. 
We should take them as seriously as our God takes them. That's why when he shows Habakkuk what is going on, Habakkuk can't stand the violence, the evil that is on, the injustice that was going on. That's why he cries out, there is destruction, violence, strife, and conflict. To prophet Micah, God uses him to speak to Israel. And Micah says, what the Lord, does the Lord require of you, O Israel? It is to act justly and love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To prophet Amos, in chapter 2, verse 6 to 7, this is what the Lord says. He says, for the sins of Israel, even for, I will not relent. For they sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as though they are dust of the ground. They deny justice to the oppressed. A father and a son use the same girl, and my name is profaned. In chapter 4 of Amos, I can see canon Amos here. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, The oppressed and the poor are crushed. The, pressed, the, the, sorry, the poor are oppressed and the needy are crushed. In Amos chapter 5, verses 11 to 12, he says, They extort unfair taxes from the poor. They oppress the innocent and they take bribes. They deprived the poor of justice in the courts of law. And when he comes to Isaiah, he tells them, Even though you fast, I will not listen to you because of your injustice, because of your sin. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, he says, Is this not the kind of fasting that I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break the yoke, to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor with shelter. <clears throat> when you see the naked, you clothe them, and you, do, you should not turn away your face from your own flesh. And to Jeremiah, he uses them, he comes out as bringing out the complaint of God and also tells them what to do. He says, do justice and righteousness in Jeremiah 22 verse 3. Do justice and righteousness. Deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. Do not wrong or do violence against the foreigner, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood. And God rebukes them. He rebukes the, the people of Judah through Jeremiah again in chapter 7. He says, will you steal and murder and commit adultery and commit perjury, meaning swear falsely, tell lies in the courts of law? Will you burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and shout out, we are redeemed? And he asks them a question redeemed to do all these abominable things? Has my house, which is called by my name, turned into a den of robbers? Behold, I have seen all this. God is not blind to the injustice that goes on. So all the time that their hearts turned away from God, he brought people to speak to them. The moment we turn our eyes away from God, we can destroy each other. There is a lot of strife and injustice, as in the days of Habakkuk. People kill one another. People sell each other into slavery. They rob others of their property. Governments overtax their people while they are doing nothing to improve their lives. Parents rape and defile their children. People, even those who call themselves Christians, swear falsely in the courts of law. They engage in deceit. They demand bribes and deny justice to those who need and deserve it. Are these things happening in our country, in Uganda? Let's examine our country. What is happening now? We begin with our homes. How do we treat people who live with us? They are people. Even if those who say they are Christians and go around saying we are Baroque and sing to tenders, they use maids, the house helpers at home, they don't pay them. How do we, do we treat those who are called our stepbrothers, stepsisters, stepchildren? What is happening among those who are called wives? And people suffering at the hands of others? There is killing of children and spouses and maiming them, burning them in our country. Last year, 14,000 girls were defiled in Uganda. 
some defiled by their own parents. And 140 boys were defiled also. People as young as the age of eight. How about if we examine our public social sector? There are many Ugandans who are lied to the young people that some companies are going to get them jobs abroad. They ask their parents to sell the, the, the plots of land that are remaining on top of what they sold when they were paying fees. And they go to companies to pay for air ticket and visa only to be sold into slavery. It is happening in Uganda. And some of these companies are owned by Christians who come to church and they want to please the pastor by giving tithe. Like in the days of Habakkuk and Amos, there is strife. The poor are being sold for money. There are illegal evictions of people from their land so that private developers can put this land to use what they call to put it to use as if it is not in use by people staying on it. They put buildings and they make a lot of money in disregard of the plight of the poor that they removed. Like in the days of Prophet Amos. We are treating the poor like they are dust. In this country, it is happening. How about in matters of governance? A lot of embezzlement of public funds. Mistreatment of government workers because of, of the ideology, what they believe in. Unfair recruitment. To, to places of work, nepotism. A lot of unexplainable murders in this country, disappearances of people, not limited to the poor only, but there are even those we thought were powerful and they die and we can't get proper explanation. We are in a country where our leaders, including our president, keep on rewarding and appointing and entrusting the corrupt with public resources. And when the president receives the reports from commissions of inquiry, which are also paid to do the work, from the auditor general's of office, from the IGG's office, from intelligence about the thuggery and robbery that is going on in this country, he shelves the reports. Nothing is seen to be done. We are in a country where the executive agrees with members of parliament to share money among themselves so that they can both protect each other. And they continue to rob public resources. Then our president gets a microphone and he says, show me the corrupt and I deal with them. When he is sitting and eating with them at the same table, at the expense of the taxpayers who are left to wallow in poverty and suffering because there are no social services. Is there still a question among us whether we need a message about justice today? When people are dying of treatable diseases <clears throat> and civil servants who retire die before getting their pension after struggling for so many years, coming from up country, including selling their land, the remaining one, to get what to bribe the government officers with. And the government officers keep giving them empty promises, saying, come again next week, come again next week, until the person dies. Strife and injustice, like in the days of Habakkuk. We are in a country where most of us, the church leaders, are deceived that we have to, we have to be assimilated in the system, the government system. And then we get satisfied when they keep on talking about us. He is a good man. He's a good woman. He doesn't cause trouble. And then in turn, we insulate government from accountability by rebuking the, those whom we call the ungrateful because they have spoken out against the evil and injustice. Some of us, the religious leaders, have become agents of the state instead of agents of God's kingdom. Instead of rebuking sin, we rebuke those who stand up to challenge evil that is going on in this country. Those who stand up, we call them ungrateful, agitators for trouble, disobedient, lacking humility, lovers of the spotlight, and in some cases, we say that they need psychological help. Do we need a message about justice? Is this message relevant to us today? We are in a country where it is normal to see a mother die in the corridors of the hospitals and her center wards, trying to give birth on her own while doctors and midwives are passing by. Many people's lives in this nation 
are being sacrificed at the altar of greed and corruption. Are we different from Judah that prophet Habakkuk is speaking to? The children who are studying from under trees, writing in the dust while being beaten by the rain. And a lot of money is stolen. Too, too much. We are in a country, by the way, where a few individuals are literally hoarding cash in their houses, in rooms. They put padlocks. Others put in ceilings of their houses. And the government, those in authority, pretend like they don't know what is going on. We are in a country where there are thieves and robbers at the pulpit. In the name of pastors, they use the pulpit to lie, to manipulate, and coerce people to give what they have to them, never to be accounted for. In the name of giving blessings, and they, they know how much to apportion to each one, as though they are God. And then they continue to sing praises of the people in authority so that they don't touch them. Why does this happen? Because some of us are not really shepherds. We are wolves feasting on the sheep. It is happening in this country. Taxes are being increased every year. And as a doctor prayed, the debt burden is increasing every year. Tax increasing, debt burden increasing. Because what is raised is not put to use. We borrow in order to, to pretend that we are doing so much. <clears throat> Unfortunately for us, we are in a country where even those who are agitating to be the ones who want to bring change, they are agitating for justice and condemning injustice and corruption. They themselves are violent, unjust, and corrupt. They are destroying people's properties in the name of rioting or demonstration, burning petrol stations, staging illegal roadblocks on the pathways, and extorting money from people who have been working the whole day so that they can go and feed their families. They are beating up people on their way, harassing and abusing people who are going to do work or even going home. Some even rely on tribal grounds. And then they claim to be fighting corruption and injustice. And uh, I have more disappointing news for the young people today, the young generation. We have no mentors in this country, in the world. They, they are no mentors. And if they are there, they are so scarce that finding them is so hard. There's a story of a young man at Makere University who did pharmacy, and then he went to work with the Minister of Health in this country. In the department that tests drugs that come in. And sometimes they import drugs that are expired. They agree with the sellers. Why, what do you think explains the reason why they ban drugs every year? That they are expired. How could they not be distributed to hospitals, yet hospitals are empty? And the young man was given drugs when he tested them. He found they could not work. They could not be given for, to people for treatment. <clears throat> and he gave a report as thus. The drugs cannot work. They expired. And it reached the minister who was involved in the deal. And the minister came to his office, put a gun on his table, and he said, you must give a report that says that these drugs are okay. And the man said, let me think about it. Tomorrow I will make a report. The following day he came with a resignation letter. In Uganda... One minister who was involved in stealing money meant for the AIDS and HIV program asked the judge, where were you when you were in the bush? When the judge had asked him to explain why he ate money that was meant for public service. A country where thieves and robbers become so entitled, they have stolen so much that they think it is their right to continue to steal. How is it here at UCU? Are things okay? <clears throat> There's a time I was proud of the system here when I was doing my, my first degree. Some of us who studied 
when we are being sponsored because we wouldn't have managed to be here, we didn't have dollar accounts as it is with most of students. So some of the money from sponsors came through the university account. And that time, the university will remove their due and give to the student the balance. I hear things changed. <laughs> is that justice? <clears throat> what mentorship do we give to these children that see us cheat when we are a Christian university? And we have ways of explaining why we cheat. What we are teaching them is that it is okay to steal and still explain why you stole. That's what we are teaching them because they see us stealing and then we sing to tenderism. Unfortunately, like Jeremiah said in chapter 5, verse 30 to 31, he says, a horrible and shocking thing has happened in this land. The prophets prophesy lies and the priests rule by their own authority, not by God's authority. And he adds that unfortunately, my people love it this way. God's people love it this way when they are false prophecies and the priests telling lies. It is so unfortunate that the many people we look up to for mentorship are the ones encouraging us to be good at injustice and corruption. <clears throat> we are in a country where tribalism and hatred for people because of where they come from is encouraged by those who should be fighting it. Maybe because they benefit from it when they stand on the ticket of tribalism. They get the votes. So it doesn't matter who else is hurt. So the last question is, what should we do as Christians who are in this country? What do we do who are living at a time like it was in the time of Judah, the time of Habakkuk and Jeremiah, when God sent the Babylonians to destroy the nation? Are we going to wait for God to destroy Uganda? What shall we do? Friends, it begins at the cross. We cannot witness, as Christians, we cannot witness about what we don't understand. A witness is someone who speaks with knowledge and conviction about what they are speaking about. How can you witness and advocate for justice as a Christian when you are disconnected from the author of justice? Without God in our hearts, all we have are mere shadows and short-lived feelings of the desire for change and for justice, which lasts for a short time. The way we get shadows in the morning and at some point they disappear. That's why we have people who claim that they went to the bush to fight corruption and injustice. And when they come back, they tried for a short time. And now they are doing the very things they came to. They claim that they came to fight. In a short while, the shadow went. They had felt the oppression and injustice. They had seen it. And they felt like we are the ones who are right. We will change it. But they were not connected to the author of justice. That's what happens. So long as we are not connected to Jesus, the, our corrupt nature will continue leading us. As long as the passion goes, we fall back into sin. That's why it begins at surrendering to Christ. Even those who are agitating for change, for justice now, as long as they are not connected to Christ, they will just do the same. It will be a change of, of God's, but not a change of the system. Maybe they just want to replace those who are there so that they can also be the ones to do it. At Christ, at the cross, we learn how to deny ourselves, to surrender to Christ's leadership. When we come to Christ, and we face him, and he gives us forgiveness, and he shows us his love. We respond in love, because we understand how much we have been loved to be forgiven. And there, a corrupt heart is turned into a kind heart. A murderer is turned into a protector of life. A thief becomes a giver, and a greedy and selfish person becomes generous, because Jesus is at work. Praise the Lord. At the cross, we understand what it means to stand up for Christ and what it means to run away from the truth. Unfortunately, there are so many Christians in, in the world, mostly in Uganda and Africa, who think that being humble 
as the Bible calls us to be, means to always submit to leaders in authority, even when they are committing evil. If that was the case, <clears throat> that being humble means to submit to everything, Jesus wouldn't have condemned the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. John the Baptist wouldn't have condemned King Herod when he committed adultery with his brother's wife. You ask Daniel and his friends, they were humble, they respected the king. But when a law was given that they should worship the king, not God, they were defiant. They said no. In the face of ungodliness and wickedness, Christians are called to be defiant, to refuse. But we have to be aware that even as we refuse wickedness because of the overwhelming presence of evil and its acceptance around us, in our circles, in churches, in government, in the institutions and organizations where we work, because of overwhelming presence of evil, there is a high temptation to feel that you are the one who is wrong even when you are right. Because the world turns what is right to be wrong and what is, right be what is wrong becomes right. You may even doubt God's word. You ask Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was called in chapter 1, God says, see, I have appointed you and given you authority over kingdoms and thrones. To, to, to uproot and tear down, to plant and to build. God is giving him authority over kingdoms. And when he goes to preach, he preaches against the evil that is taking place. And because it is too much, and there are prophets who are also speaking out, giving wrong prophecies, he is arrested and he is imprisoned and he is beaten up. And when he comes out, he decides to run away. And when he is running away, God tells him, go back and preach. And then he says, oh God, you deceived me and I was deceived. In Jeremiah chapter 20, he says God is a liar because what he was seeing was different from what God said from the start. There is a possibility of doubting God's word in the face of injustice when it is overwhelming. In chapter 20 verse 7 he says, oh God, you deceived me and I was deceived. I would even keep quiet but the problem is that when I keep quiet, your word burns inside me like fire. So I won't manage to keep quiet. Because there is so much evil and God has given him a spirit that enables him to see what is taking place. He feels what God feels. And he can't sustain, he can't contain keeping quiet about it. Submitting to Christ and standing up for justice can lead us into physical trouble. Some people will not understand you. Others will see you as a threat and they will seek to eliminate you. Others will dismiss you as being misled and an, an agitator for conflict. Those who are satisfied with the system will come up with trumped up charges, lies against you, so that you are seen as the one who is corrupt. These days they can even make your voice, you sound as if you are ordering. I mean, they use technology and Somebody who listens to the audio thinks you are the one who is speaking. They can put charges against you like you raped someone. And they don't mind about winning the case. All they mind about is making sure that to the public, you are seen as not credible. Ask Daniel in the den of lions. Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego in the midst of fire. That's what happened. But God never abandons his people. When he intervenes in your situation, the likes of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the likes of King Darius, of Pasha, they will submit and worship your God because you stood up for him. <laughs> when God intervenes, you will be promoted in the presence of your enemies. Those who thought you were going to die in the den of lions, they will be surprised when you are the one on top. Of course, we know that we cannot attain true justice in this world until Christ comes again to reign, and when we shall reign with him in glory. But for now, we are called to shine the light as those who are called by his name so that his justice is seen, so that those who are hopeless can hear our voices say that God knows what is going on and he condemns it. 
Proverbs 31 verse 8 says, Speak up and judge fair. Defend the cause of the poor. And speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. While doing this, we must be assured that God is at work doing something. Let's never doubt that. He is at work always. Like he told Habakkuk, that look at the nations and watch, in chapter 1 verse 5, and be utterly amazed. For I'm doing, I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe it, even if you were told. Hallelujah. I'm going to do something that you would not believe it, even if you were told. So he says, it doesn't matter the violence and injustice. You see around, I am at work. I am still on the throne and I am in charge. Nobody else is. You might have suffered at the hands of people. Or you are struggling with sin. The devil is directly making you a slave. You are called to come back to God, to the cross, because he is at work. He is able to intervene in the situation. Don't give up. Will you trust him? Like Habakkuk said in chapter 2, he eventually praises God. He says, the righteous, the just shall live by faith. Praise the Lord. You have to live by faith and there will be an overcomer. Christ calls us to himself and he says, when we are weary and tired of the situations that we are in, we need to come to him and he will be the one to give us rest. We can't fight this the struggle, in the struggle alone. We need him to give us rest. May he bless you as he draws you to himself and stand up for justice as Christians.